And so, come with me to the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 1 to 27. So, Dad, I'm so sorry. I forgot to give it to you this morning. 2 Kings, chapter 5, verse 1 to, 1 to 27. It's a long scripture, but you don't have to run through the entire scripture. We will just pick up. So, this morning, I want, I've simply put it together, a bloke called Naaman. That's the simple topic, a bloke called Naaman. So I was in the United States last week, and so I kept on, you know, this bloke and that bloke, and eventually someone puts their hands up. So one of the American congregants, can we know what bloke means? What's bloke means? And I had to tell them exactly what it means. Ah, we don't use these words. I know you guys don't use these words. Right. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1 to 27. Some of you guys know, I, you know, you know uh, young chess will actually bring this. Some of you guys know there is a man called Naaman. And all of you guys will know that he is a Syrian commander. He seemed to have uh, really, really done well. He has conquered on numerous, he's gone to numerous battles and he's fought in numerous battles and he's actually won. And obviously, you know, Bible does not say, but I believe if he was living today at this point in time, he will possibly have the purple medal by the Americans or the, you know, the, you know, the medal of valor by what the Queen of England will give it to you. And so this guy is a seasoned warrior. But if you were to come with me, come with me right now, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 3 at this moment, we find that this young man has got an illness and this illness is something to be frowned upon or not to be happy about it. But rather, should I say, that people might look at him very, very strangely. So 2 Kings chapter 5. And so scripture says to me, it says, verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. But, uh, because, by him the Lord, uh, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. So like I said, you know, the Queen of England will give him a medal. But, he, but then he says, can you see, but, I like but. There's always a but in everyone's life. But a leper. Something to be frowned upon. Something that you don't like to have it. And so I want to encourage you this morning that you will come to the service and you will say, I am good, I'm good, I'm good, but this, 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 this. I'm good at this, I'm good at that, but I, you know, I've got this, I've got this home, I've got this car, I've got this, but, 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 but. There's always a but. The scripture says, but a leper. Now a Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man, eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also led a mighty man. But then he says, and then he say, he says, and he also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. What if, if I were to say this morning, and you are saying, you are not physic you know, physically, you're going through whatever that you're going through right now. But physically, you're not a leper, but physically something else which is not right with your life. Something else people look at you. Something else that people say, I don't know, I've got a check. I have got a check about, I've got a check in my spirit about, you know, about land. I've got a check about, in my spirit about Luke. You know, there's always a but. You see, I want, you know, I just, I, I want to un unpack this and I want to see what God can do. So number one, I want to let you know right now, there's nothing too hard for God to perform a miracle in your life. Okay? There's nothing too hard for God to perform a miracle. So we come on a Friday service and we are all often asking, God, will you meet my needs? And if I were to meet your, if I were to meet, if I would, if you were to meet my needs, I will do this, I'll do that, I'll do all the above. But there are sometimes, before you receive that miracle, before God is, is able to perform something powerful in your life, there are sometimes, there are certain things which might block you in order to receive the, 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 the gift that God wants to give it to you. In other words, we would love to become our own stumbling block. There's a great saying, you can be your own worst enemy. Naaman is, can be his, his own worst enemy. So the second point I have written over here, I'm so sorry I haven't given to my dad. Number, this a, a, the number one point, humans are subjected by deadly problems. I've written this, humans are subjected by deadly problems. Is this something that you have done or is it something that you have allowed? Is it something that you have, what I call it, self-inflicted pain 
or someone has caused a pain. Has caused a pain. Irregardless of self-infliction or irregardless of someone has caused, at the end of it, can I say this? We do live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world that we were introduced to us, none other than Adam and Eve, our great-great-great-parents, they did not do a great job, but they did a stuff-up job for us. And out of that, the heart of the entire stuff up, you and I have been spewed into this earth. But we are not blaming our four parents, but we are asking, is there a redemption? Is there a salvation? Is there a breakthrough? Is there some more rather God will come and speak to me and will start to take all the nervousness and all the pain, agony, sorrow out of my life? And so you ask yourself, is God going to do something? So that's why I said, a bloke called Naaman. And I say, nothing is too hard for God to do what he wants to do. But then I also say to you right now, if I were to write a thesis, and the thesis would be, I have written over this here, humans are subjected by deadly problems. Whether you like it or not, it is part and parcel of your problems. So stop blaming God, stop blaming your brothers, stop blaming your sisters, and stop blaming your parents. You see, my son comes, Jesse comes and says, he says one day, mom, mom, dad, yeah. And I said, what, what seemed to be wrong? I don't like my name. I said, what do you want me to do? Do you think, um, you know, why, you know, why, you know, why do we got two J's? Jesse and Joshua. Couldn't you get, you know, like, like, you know, one is Jesse, the other one is Thomas, or one will Thomas, the other one will be Michael. Why do we have to have J? And he said to me, I don't like my name. Is it possible I can change my name? I said, either you put up or you live with that. And so my point is, you know, he, you know, he came up to me, he said to me, he's trying to find a problem. I remembered you know, when I was growing up, I did not like my name. I, to be honest, I also went to an identity crisis. I said to my mom and dad, why did you call me Reginald? And said, so they said, what did you want? It? I said, Francis would be great. <laughs> and what else, mom said? I said, Robin would be great. R-O-B-I, I would have forgotten, Robin would be great. I th but I think Francis would be fantastic. Dad looked at me and said, well, it's too late. That's the name that God has named you. You love your name. You see, someone is happy with their name. <laughs> Humans are subjected by deadly problems. Second point, Naaman refused to follow the prophet's instructions. I come across a lot of people, and people will sit down with either Chazzy or either yeah, with Diane or, 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 or Denise or Len Forder, they will speak into their life and they'll say, Lundy, please, can I ask you, the next time you meet, check them out. The next time you go, check the house out. They will give you right orders, right principles, and right instructions. And guess what? They will know none of our people will listen to guys, to men, and to women who have gone ahead of us, 50 years, 60 years ahead of us. See, yesterday I was trying to track down my, one of my father figures because I'm trying, to make a, make a, I'm trying to make a big decision. This father figure who has brought me up since the age of 14, he has now been in the ministry for 45 years. I can hear the voice of God, but sometimes it's nice to go and see a man who has been in the ministry for 45 years, who has raised me up from, uh, from the age of 14. I will say, Dad, can you please tell me what God is saying? And I, I knew what God has already said, but I needed another one more confirmation to feel that I am doing the right decision in order in, in relation for this church. And finally, Dad picks up. It's not an easy man to get all of. He picks up. He only gives me seven minutes. Tell me, what do you want, son? I tell him all the entire problems. He says, this is, this is, this. And then he says, is there anything else? I said, nothing else. I'll speak to you soon. He hangs up the phone. My point is, I just want to say that when your mom and when your dad or when your spiritual mom or when your spiritual dad, when they do give you an instruction, please, can I ask of you, follow what they say. Because they carry years of wisdom and they carry years of experience. Something that I find in this country where, you know, where men and women, when they get old, they get relegated. And our younger generation do not want to really take advantage because that man, that woman have gone through a years ahead and you, instead of you making the mistake, you can avert and avoid the mistake because they made mistakes in front of you. But most of us will say, no, 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 he's obsolete, he's a dinosaur. <laughs> I know. I have said, have you ever spoken to Len? Have you ever spoken, oh, Pastor Richard, they're dinosaurs. So imagine what they must be saying to me. I must, be a, I must be a medium dinosaur because I'm 51. 
And so, you know, I, I, it's interesting how my generation, my, you, know, you know, when me dad, you know, you know, when my dad brought me up, you'll often say, don't go and see your peers and to your friends and ask them for advice because they do not know anything. My dad says, when you are going to ask for someone's advice, go men with men and women who are in their 60s and 70s. They will have pearls of wisdom. You see, that's how I was brought up. But the current generation, if I tell them, no, Pastor Rich, I'm not going to ask a person. I said, why? Is they're a dinosaur. They don't know what, they, what you know, they don't know what they're going through. No, I just have to be honest with you. They've actually gone through much harder than you guys have. You see, I, you, you know, I, I, mean, I, mean, I, I was in the military. I was in the armed forces. And I'm not having a go with any of the younger generation. Please get my heart right. I'm not having a go. But if I get the current younger generations, a whole lot of Koreans are going to come after you guys. I'm telling you right now, our younger generation will say, I need antidepressant tablets right now. Please get me some antidepressant tablets because I'm getting depressed. I'm getting depressed. I got people, young people say, the, Pastor Rich, the sun is hitting me hard. I said, that's good. Now I'm getting depressed. The sun is hitting me hard. So imagine if the Koreans are running into this country, they will say, I need right now antidepressant tablets. Never once in my entire life I have had antidepressant tablets. I'll tell you an antidepressant tablet, sing loud to God. It leaves immediately. The moment you sing loud to God, depression leaves. It can't stay with you. It'll just vanish away. But we don't sing. We just become, it's the, what I call the me, me factor, the me, me syndrome. Let me look. It's what I call navel gazing. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Politicians love, in this country, politicians love to look at their navel. I call them navel gazing. You see, the more you look at navel-gazing, it's a hole. You look at it, and you become like a hole. You go in the hole. <laughs> can I kindly say this, guys? Don't do that. Well, yeah. And so, can I have the scripture, Isaiah 55, verse 8? Isaiah 55, verse 8. Brian Houston once came into my Bible college. He started to say to me, he started to speak to us, about 25 students, and I was one of them. This was 1990. He had a mullet. He had a big mo, and his hair was, you know, he, you know his hair looks like Jimmy Barnsey. So he came into the college, and he walked in. And says, he's, you know, one of the first things he said, to, he said to the class, when you preach, when you teach, if you don't laugh, if you don't enjoy, then your congregation is going to sleep. But when you preach, if you think you're, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, your sermon makes you laugh, that means your sermon must be good. And so I have to laugh because I'm enjoying my own sermon. So I'll never forget what Pastor Brian Houston said 30 years ago when I was 20 years of age. Imagine how, how young I was. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Okay? He says here, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. You see, what I want to encourage you, that Naaman came with a preconceived idea, and he was going to, this is Naaman, I'm with Uncle Bob, this is Naaman, and he was expecting Elisha to come out, lay his hands in the name of Jesus, I command this leprosy to go, now it's leaving. It did not happen to him. And so, why do I bring this scripture? Come with me to the scripture, uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 9 to 12. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 to 12. He gets offended. He gets upset. Can I tell you right now, this morning, some of you guys might be multi-millionaires you are sitting over here. If you are that person, please come and see me. I'll cancel all the appointments because I need some finance to build this brand new church at number 14 Mumford Way in Balcada. And then some of you guys are really, really doing well in your business and entrepreneurial. Some of you guys are doing extremely well in your marriage. Some of you guys have brought up your children really well. Whatever it is, your success is, you might come over here and you might say, do you know who I am? And so if you come and say to God, God, do you know who I am? He is G-O-D after all. He is the master of all universe. And so, you see, you see Naaman comes out, out in the open. He says, I am the Syrian commander. I am someone. My, the king has honored me. Thus, Elisha knows who I am. You see, the, uh, the other point is, if you are going to get healed, never ever tell yourself or boast yourself and blow your own trumpet telling God, God, do you know who I am? You see, you then will start to put what I call, you're already starting to put a stumbling block for God not to heal you. 
Okay, so scripture says the Naaman went with his horses and chariot. He stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, "Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean." Very simple, isn't it? very simple instructions. You see, a lot of people will take this Bible and they'll complicate this Bible. Instead of A, B, C, it becomes A to Z. My point is, is every, you know, I mean, theologians are great. If you look at Armenian, he's a great theologian. If you look, see the Dutch theologian called Huss. And if you look at, you know, Calvin, the Swiss reformer, you look at John Knox, all these theologians are great. There's nothing wrong with theologians. But with God, when it comes to, he tends to spell it out in simple, uh, simple, in definite terms. You see, he's expected to lay his hands and to come and say, Oh, you commander, how well are you right now? How are you today? Let me pray. He wanted all the pomp and pompous ceremony for him. But God says, I am not going to do that with you. I'm going to do it very differently. And so the scripture says over here, but Naaman became, can you see this? Naaman became furious. Out of this furious, if you go into, a, into what we call etymological study, which means study of words, that's what it means, in a Bible called seminary. And in, in this furious, what happens is he gets offended. He gets offended. Offense, I wrote a book, a free book for this entire church because at the end of it, I got sick and tired. People get offended. They say, you know, I, people get offended. You know, if I'm speaking to someone, if I don't say g'day to them, they said, I'm leaving the church. People have left the church because I did not greet them. And literally, I've been busy because I'm doing that. And I, I, I asked Pastor Lee and I asked someone, I said, why did that person, oh, you didn't say to them, good morning, Pastor Rich. You guys are laughing, but it's happened a lot of times. And, I, and I've gone back and written back. I said, please forgive me. I was speaking. Yeah, you were speaking. I understand. And you know, they won't tell you. But you know, behind the scenes, they tell, Pastor H never greeted me. And so scripture says, but Naaman became furious, went away and said, indeed, I said to myself. He, he said, I said to myself, why did Lucifer fell? I ascend to heaven. I am like the most high God. How many times does he say? Five times or four times he says, I, 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 I. The moment you say, I did this, I built this church, I'm telling you right now, God will say, ta-ta to you. Nebuchadnezzar comes out, out of his balcony, looks at his palace, he says, I built Babylon. God says to me, you did Babylon. Okay, great. We will make you now a werewolf. For the next seven years, then he, uh, he went out like a werewolf and he was grazing grass in front of his palace. He learned his lesson. I did not build anything. I did not do anything. In fact, if anything else, I think I'm a professional beggar in this church. I beg on behalf of God. He says to me, oh, sometimes, I wanted to build this, I wanted to build this. He said, I, said, I said, God, where's the money? Money is coming, go and ask. I said, you sit on the throne, I'm the beggar for you. I said, why not you go and ask? No, no, it's your job. You need a partner with me. I need a partner. But you sit down comfortably, and then I have to ask. And that people can throw potatoes, some eggs, and tomatoes in my face. Yeah, don't worry, but my grace is over you. I, I think this is a complaint between me and my God. I think today I'm having a frustrating time. So, let's go. Indeed, I said to myself, can I have the next one? He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name. Can you see that, what I'm trying to say? Call the name of the oh Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Pharaoh, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in what? In a rage. Have you ever seen the road rage in Perth? I find it extraordinary. You should drive in India, guys. You should drive in some of the third world countries. You know what? You know, in those countries when you drive, in those countries when you drive the car, do you know, do you know, do you know which part of the car actually wears out very quickly? The horn. The horn wears out. Every year, once a year, once, the Indians have to change the horns. Pot, 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 pot. And you need to say, the cows are going, the donkeys are going, the horses are going. And I could never see a road rage. Here, just a guy goes in, and then immediately everyone goes up, and baseball bats comes out. 
I said to myself, why? You go and drive in India, I'm telling you, you go and drive in Sri Lanka, you won't survive a day. The way they drive are mad lunatics. Yet, the way, you know, they'll give a thumbs up, they'll give our hands, and every car, they've got their own system within the context of their own culture, and the way, no traffic lights, no nothing, just stop here, stop there, honk here, honk there, and no rage. But over here, we've got first world developed country, and there's a rage going on all the time. Anyhow, that's not why I want to share that with you. And so, my point is, let's go through very quickly because I am running out of time right now. So, Naaman refused to follow the prophet's instructions. One, he becomes very offended. Two, he becomes rage. And that's why I'm saying to you, whatever the God wants to do in your life, He's not going to do it in your style. He's not going to do it in your fashion. He will do it in His style and in His own fashion. Don't try to tell him how to do his miracles. Don't try to tell him, you shall have to perform this miracle that way, you shall perform this way. He does not like that. Please drop those things before God. It is a stumbling block before God. Let him do how he wants to do, what he wants to do in the presence of the Almighty God. The third point, can I have the scripture, 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, verse 13. God shows mercy when we obey him. God shows mercy when we obey Him. And His servants came near, spoke to Him and said, My father, He says about Elisha, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when He says to you, Wash and be clean. You see, mercy always brings the proud into humility. So God is saying to you and to me right now, you know how I operate. You know how I want to be worshipped. So at the end of it, to some of us, you like you and I, we have become very professional. We've built our lives really, really well. And we have some success in this and that and all this. And all of a sudden, when you have this encounter with Jesus, we seem to apply the same corporate success and we replicate the corporate success to the success in the kingdom of God. I've got bad news for you. The kingdom of God will not operate on corporate success. The kingdom of God only operates in the divine laws of what the kingdom of heaven has to say. So the, divine, the, so, so the kingdom of divine heaven, all it says, go and dip yourself in River Jordan seven times. Go and wash yourself. You will see leprosy will leave. The corporate sector will say, please take up 50 forms and fill up all the forms and I want to see this is how you answer the questions. And then I'll think about it. Then I'll process about it. And then I'll see how and what I can do for you. You see, the, co the corporate world cannot compete with the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God has got its own time, how it operates, how it functions. The one thing I want to show this to you right now, the sure mercy, the sure seed of, uh, the sure, the, the, uh, the, the, the sure, uh, mercy seat of David is available for you, for you and I. And that's what, we are saying, that's what we want to say. And so we find that God shows mercy when we obey, obey Him. Can I have the scripture, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. The other thing I just want to say is, when God decides to do something with your life, don't bargain with Him. Don't bargain with Him. It won't go well. Don't bargain with Him. He knows exactly what to do. And so verse 14, it says over here, So he went down and dipped seven times in Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You see, when you bargain, when you argue, when you debate with God, I'm telling you right now, it, God will put you in the last in the list. But if you say, my Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. I remember a lady came up to me one day. This was years ago, 27, 28 years of age. Just starting my ministry, just starting to hear the voice of God. She comes up, the pastor comes and he says, the pastor comes up, with the, the pastor says, this person has got two kidneys aching, Pastor Rich. And it's painful right now. And it's, and it's not good. And so God says, very simply, in my heart, he says, tell her to go back home to get the kitchen tap. He did not say the tap in the bathroom, anything, in the kitchen tap, ask her to get six glasses of water. He says to me, in my spirit, I was a young man. I said to the pastor, I said to the lady, I said, could you kindly go and get 
six glasses of water in your kitchen tap and drink that water. The pastor came, came, gave me a funny look and the lady was more open. She started giggle and laugh at me. Because you know, when you're 27, 28, you know, they don't take you serious because I can understand because I'm not, I'm not like who I am today right now. And, they, you know, and you're young. And God says to me, don't be intimidated by, what they are, by, by the looks they give. Tell them again firmly. I told them again firmly. And they sort of, yeah, 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 kind of thing. You, you know, they didn't tell you that, but you know out of their heart. The lady went back and drank the water six times. That was how many years ago? 28 years ago. 28 years later, whenever I go back, she has got no more pain in her kidneys. Out of a six simple glass of water. Haven't had to take the kidneys out. Don't have to replace the kidneys. And one day the lady came. 26 years later she came. I laughed at you because you're 27 years of age. I thought you're a small kid. You do not know what you're doing. But because what you said, those kidneys are still operating. You see, my point is, we make, we like, you know, when we look at God, we expect some things to be done. You go through on the left hand side, on the right hand side, I'll be waving at you, and then you come down, I want to lay your hands. We make God very complicated. Yet God says, no, I'll give you very simple instructions. Follow the simple instructions, everything will be taken care of. Okay? So, like Latin Father says, obedience. So, next thing, can I have 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15? Surrender yourself to God. Can I have 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15? Surrender yourself to God. It's a scripture says, And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. It's ultimately you surrendering. You see, you got an ego. You are somebody. I am Luke. I'm Rich Marais. I'm Len Forder. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done for you? Uh, I, I haven't shared this story. Yeah. So my wife and I and the kids were flying into Singapore. You remember a couple of months ago, my mom turned 70 years of age. So I didn't tell my mom that we were going to rock up. We were going to give her a, a surprise birthday visit. So as we were at the Perth International Airport and we were about to board Singapore International Airlines, SIA, somebody blessed us and we were about to board. And all of a sudden, on the mic, it says, your flight has been delayed by 10 minutes. Your flight has been delayed by 10 minutes. And I know because I was born, raised in Singapore. And Singapore Airlines are very fussy. They do it everything like a machine. And I said to my wife, I turned around and I said, Singapore Airlines do not like to lose their reputation. They do not like to lose their face. Am I right, mom? Am I right? And they, they, everything, chop, 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 everything has been done. I know because I was born then, I, I, I came. And they say, 10 minutes has been a delay. I said to my wife, they are bringing someone. I said to my wife, they are bringing someone. But God did not say anything more than else. They are bringing someone. And I said, so I did not know. All of a sudden, my wife and I and the children are waiting over here. It's been delayed. And all of a sudden, you, you should see Australian federal police, local police, bodyguards. And guess who in the middle of it? It's David Cameron, the former British prime minister. He, you know, he, you know, he's flagged by the AFP guys. He's flagged by everyone. He walks in. And even though he's a former British prime minister, there was a kind of a certain air of his presence. Wow, it's David Cameron. And I said, I said to my wife, I tapped her, it's David Cameron, it's David. The entire lot looks at it. So we finally realized SIA, or Singapore International Airlines, was stopped 10 minutes because of David Cameron. My wife was very cheeky. This is how cheeky she was. So we got in the plane, as usual, he is a former prime minister. He gets the first line in, 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 in business class in, in Singapore Airlines. So my, my wife and I, and the kids are going through. My wife stopped. Hey, David, how are you? <laughs> like, like, you know, even, I mean, I'm the one who always does that. And I have done it to me, a lot of people. But this time, when I look at this man, he, you know, he, you know he wore, he's a former British prime minister. Hey, David, how are you? <laughs> he says, yes, I'm very good. I just want to let you know, you did a pretty good job. You know, you know, when you were a prime minister, have a wonderful flight. And she just walks away. This is my wife. Oh, my goodness. And so, why am I telling this, and how is it now connected to this story? I don't even know where I'm going through right now. 
And he returned to the man of God. He and all his aides came and stood before him. And he said, indeed, now I know there is a God. You see, yeah, the reason why I say this, we know when a former prime minister or the current prime minister or former president or the current president, there's an air about them. But I don't think so when it comes to God, we do give him that respect, that knowledge. There's an air about Jesus. There's an air about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, when he visits you, it's like something so different. It's supernatural. It's divine. But I don't think so. We tend to give more importance to a former British Prime Minister than the importance to the work of God. Can I ask of you, can I encourage of you right now? This guy is a Syrian commander. He says he's, he thinks he's somebody. But then God says, no, you're not somebody. At the end of it, I'm treating you as my son. I'm asking you to do the things what I'm calling you to do so. A couple of two more points, and I'll finish this off, and then I'll start to pray, and I've got an appointment at half past 12, and I don't want to be late for that. Can I have 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Don't live under the shadow of our problems. Don't live under, don't live under the shadow of our problems. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Very simple. And the very last point, I'm going to finish this. The life-changing part of God. Can I have Psalms 55, verse 22? Psalms, the book of Psalms 55, verse 22. And I want to finish this off. Cast your burden on the Lord. He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be removed. Very simple, guys. I've followed this God all through my life, 30 years. I often tell myself, in a very humble way, I said, my Lord, I've seen it all. He says, no, you ain't seen anything just yet. I, I, I quoted this, the Americans laughed and laughed and laughed at me when I quoted this words. how you Yanks are, 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 you know, often say. And even in the last few weeks, the way that God uh, he, you know, healed miraculously Asperger's kids, uh, autistic kids in the United States, and I just, I, I have come, I've come back to God and I said, God, I, I, I can't phantom you. I don't even know who you are. He says, I know. Well, well, no, no, you know me. I said, no, I do not know who you are. Because this kid wants to punch every, you know, you know, you know the highly, fu highly functioning autistic kid becomes, you know, God decides to heal him, calms him down and brings the presence of God. And I, I, I'm flawed. And I just look at God. I'm looking at God one more time. Do I really know you who you are? And so, you know, some of the things that God did in the United States in the last 14 days has been phenomenal. And I even am re-evaluating my relationship with God. Do I really know you? Because I don't think so, I know you. And so, you know, uh, you know because every time when God confounds you with a powerful miracle, with a powerful supernatural ability for Him to touch, it changes your heart, it changes your perspective, it changes your relationship with God, and the relationship goes to another level. Can I ask of you right now? I don't want to wake. I don't want. I, I, it's Friday. I, yesterday morning, I was teaching the class from 9 o'clock right up to 12 o'clock. Last night, I was teaching the class from 7 o'clock right up to, I think, uh, right up to 10 o'clock. And I'm tired. I did not go to sleep until 12 o'clock. In the middle of the night, he starts to speak to me. I don't want to come over here. The only reason I keep on coming back to church, the only reason I keep on coming back to see what God can do, because he never ceased to amaze me. I want you to have that heart. Never cease to amaze you. After 30 years walking with God, 38 years I've known Him personally, He's been a powerful God. Can I have all eyes closed? All head is bowed. I'm going to close this service right now. And then straight away, we'll go into a time of prayer to pray for people. My Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus, God. Give you praise and thanks right now. You'll honor, you'll bless, you'll touch and you will bring, God, a change in people's life right now. I'm not the author, the finisher of our faith, but you are the author and the finisher of our faith. So this morning we pray, we ask of God, in the name of Jesus, people who have walked in over here, people who have drove from all parts of Perth, we pray, we ask of you in the name of Jesus, there ought to be healing, there ought to be transformation, there ought to be change, there ought to be a breakthrough, there ought to be things that you're going to do, God, in a powerful manner that we've never, ever come across, God. And so if you are here and you are saying, this is my first time I've approached here right now, but before that miracle can take place in your life, in my life, can I say this? There's a small little prerequisite or a criteria that God is asking. 
Would you like to give your heart to Jesus? This Jesus came and died for you on the cross of Calvary. By His blood, you and I have been redeemed from the curse of the law so that He can bring us into the kingdom of light. Very simple. If you are that person and you are saying, I want that Jesus, I want to try Him for my life at this moment. I want, him, I want Him to walk with me. If you are that person and you are saying, I want that Jesus, then all you have to do right now is to walk with my Jesus and have this precious blood on your life right now. I can guarantee you, out of the healing that God gave me, at the age of 14, at the age of 19, at the age of 21, out of the Asperger's autism and of my OCD, I guarantee you, whatever the other problems would be, God will heal, God will restore you. If you are here for the first time, and you know, to those of you guys who have done this once, twice, thrice, four times, don't do it over and over again. I'm calling for people who are first-timers. And you are saying, I want Jesus for the first time. If you are that person, raise your left hand and your right, uh, your left hand or your right hand up in the air, and you're doing a first-time commitment, and you're saying, I want Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. Is there anyone? Very, very quickly. One hand, any hands to, to put up, and you're saying, I want Jesus. Last night, a young man gave his heart through Farid, walking with that young man. He gave his heart to the Lord. Is there anyone over here today who will say, I want Jesus for the first time? If there's none at this moment, I'm going to close this service in prayer. My Lord, as we dismiss this entire service, we pray in Jesus' name right now. You'll honor, you'll bless, you'll touch, you'll anoint right now. Touch all your people, bless all your people, and bring them through, God, what you're about to do and what you're about to do. And I pray in Jesus' name right now, honor them, bless them, God, as we enter in into a time of, uh, in a time of prayer. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. You are faithful and you're true. Through your mercy I'm made new. I will be still and know that you are God. You're my refuge and my strength, my redeemer and my friend. With all my heart, I trust in you. You are faithful and you're true. Through your mercy I'm made new I will be still And know that you are God You're my refuge and my strength My redeemer and my friend With all my heart I trust in you 